such an interesting man who's worn so many hats over his life. Uh, he's a historian, a professor, an author, a scholar. He served on the board as a board member of the Icelandic Central Bank during one of its most challenging times. Uh, he was a board member of the Montpelleron Society, an organization that many of us admire. Uh, he's been a fellow, a distinguished fellow of the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And above all, he's been a great friend of the liberty movement worldwide. Um, so, first of all, you've uh, just had something of a landmark birthday, if you don't mind me saying. You, you just turned uh, 70 last month, uh, which is a huge milestone, and congratulations on that. So I thought there's, there's a lot to reflect on here. So perhaps we should go back to the very beginning. So how, how was it that you first became involved in the classical liberal movement? Is this a microphone working? No. Hello. Yes, it is working, yes. Well, actually, <clears throat> there were three books uh, that uh, put me on the path to classical liberalism. One of them was Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, which made me into a strong anti-communist, but then I only knew what I was against, not what I was for. And the two books that uh, articulated my political opinions much better than I could do myself were The uh, Open Society and Its Enemies by Karl Popper and The Road to Serfdom by Hayek. These are the three books that uh, made me into a classical liberal. And I understand that very early on in your career you actually met Hayek in Iceland. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about that. Yes, what happened was this, that uh, in uh, uh, 1979, on the 8th of May, which was Hayek's 80th birthday, a friend of mine and I, we. Uh, uh, founded the Libertarian Alliance in Iceland, and I wrote to Hayek and told him about this, and he was very pleased to hear that young people in Iceland were taking interest in his ideas. So he wrote back and said that he was willing to come to Iceland next year, and so he did in April uh, 1980, and we organized two lectures, uh, one of which was uh, called The Metal of the Middle, and the other one was about the monetary order, competition and currency. And Hayek was, uh, when I first met him at the airport in uh, Keplavik, he was just uh, looked like uh, what he was. He was a tall, mild-mannered, aristocratic uh, uh, person uh, that bore with him the, uh, the air, the spirit of the old uh, Austrian Empire. He was an extremely impressive man and a profound thinker. And what, what did uh, Professor Hayek make of his visit to Iceland? Did he ever give you any sort of parting reflections? Well, he said to us, I now realize, having seen your fisheries, your efficient fisheries, why you are so prosperous. But his uh, main uh, interest at that moment was really to refute the arguments of the opponents of Mrs. Thatcher in England. Um, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the Wets, uh, there was a contest between the Wets and the Dries, and the Dries were the supporters of Mrs. Thatcher, who was a, a, a Hayekian. So uh, his uh, piece on the muddle of the middle uh, was trying to identify the conceptual error of uh, her opponents, namely that you could have a, a distinction between laws of production and law, laws of distribution of goods. And this wasn't your first, uh, your last interaction, I should say, with Hayek, because you uh, started your academic career in the University of Iceland, but when it came to doing your um, DPhil, you went to Oxford. Uh, perhaps you could tell us first a little bit about what it was like coming from a, a relatively small country like Iceland and arriving in the United Kingdom. Well, when I w went to Oxford in 1981, I had already uh, attended one meeting of the Montpellier Society, Hayek had invited me to the uh, meeting in Stanford in 1980, and then I attended all the meetings after that, and I chose as my uh, doctoral dissertation uh, <coughs> Hayek's conservative liberalism, where I was exploring the idea whether Hayek had successfully combined conservative insights and classical liberal principles into a coherent whole. And uh, I'm not entirely sure that Hayek was happy with that theme. But uh, what we did at Oxford was we founded a Hayek Society for the discussion and debate of classical liberal ideas. And Hayek came to us and visited in, in, uh, in the spring of 1983. And uh, my supervisor, he gave a drinks party for him at uh, his college, Jesus College. 
And uh, he told us that uh, he liked burgundies uh, and he liked Chinese food. He said to, to us, uh, you see, uh, Japanese food looks very good, but it is bland in taste. So we took him in the evening to a Chinese restaurant. And there we asked him, uh, my friends and I, Professor Hayek, is it all right if we do uh, establish a Hayek Society here at Oxford? And he uh, rose up and gave a toast for the evening. This was at the end of the evening. And said to us, of course, I'm very happy that people are uh, taking interest in my ideas, especially young people, because I fell into oblivion for many years. For example, at the American Economic Association meeting in 1949, he went to a young economist and congratulated him on a new book. And then after Hayek had left, uh, the, his, uh, the colleagues of the young uh, economists uh, came to him and said, now you got the kiss of death. This was the way in which Hayek's uh, ideas were regarded uh, in the 1950s, let us say. So he said to us, uh, I'm very happy that uh, you are taking up my, my ideas. And I will permit you to use my name for the Hayek Society, but you have to promise me one thing. Do not become Hayekians. Because I have noticed that the Keynesians are much worse than Keynes, and the Marxists are much worse than Marx. And who were some of the uh, early members of the Hayek Society in Oxford? I think there are a few people who are of note today. Well, we had, uh, there were two of us doing uh, thesis or dissertations about uh, Hayek. Chandran Kukatas, who is now the dean of the business school in Singapore, and I, and then uh, Emilio Pacheco was a member of our group. Uh, he is now the, uh, he is uh, recently retired as director of, uh, of Liberty Fund, and then uh, <coughs> two professors in America. Uh, they were also uh, members there. And uh, I met Hayek uh, in Paris at the Montpellier Society meeting in 1984. And uh, I actually, it's uh, not what I was going to talk about, but I'll just tell you one little thing. Because I had read somewhere that he, he, he went by the name of Fritz. And I asked him, is it okay if I call you Fritz? And he said, well, I'll tell you the truth. I never liked that name. The name I really like is Friedrich, namely the anglicized uh, version of Friedrich. But to make a long story short, he said, well, I would be delighted to visit you or to uh, meet you. And then he dropped me a note and said, I will be in London in the spring of 1985. And uh, I'm available one evening for dinner. And I uh, told my friends this and they decided to have dinner with Hayek, the five of us coming down from London. But obviously we couldn't take uh, Hayek, Friedrich August von Hayek, uh, to dinner at the McDonald's. Uh, so I wrote to my friend, Leonard Litschio, who was in um, charge of a fund, uh, assisting uh, conferences, called the Hayek Fund. And I said, uh, can you give us a small grant so we can take Hayek to a nice place in London? And he gave us a grant and we took Hayek uh, to the Ritz Hotel in, uh, in London. And Hayek was in exceptionally good mood. He told us a lot about uh, his uh, <coughs> meetings, both with uh, American presidents, to, to believe it or not, his first meeting with uh, an American president was actually in 1923, when Hayek was a, 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 a research assistant of an American pro uh, professor, and uh, Washington DC was small enough that Calvin Coolidge could give a reception for the whole of the e Economic Association. And the one that he liked the most the meeting was uh, Ronald Reagan. He said this was an unpretentious uh, man Ronald Reagan. He came to me when I visited him in the Oval Office and said, uh, Professor Hayek, I read one book of yours, and I did so because everybody said that we agreed, and that was the road to serfdom. I really liked that book. So uh, he uh, told us a lot about the American presidents. He also told us about his meeting with uh, Pope John the Paul, or the John Paul the, uh, the II. Uh, he had used Hayek in his discussions the notion of useful myths. Uh, he considered religion to be a useful myth. And he could see that the prelate didn't really like that expression. So he changed the name and said, what we should really talk about are symbolic truths. 
and uh, the Pope uh, liked this a lot. <laughs> then he also told us then how Mrs. Thatcher had disarmed him completely. Uh, she had learned in, uh, uh, after she formed her first government in May 1979, uh, in the spring Hayek was in London and she invited him to lunch at uh, 10 Downing Street. And she greeted him at the door and she said to him in her accent, Professor Hayek, I know precisely what you're going to say. You are going to say that I haven't done enough. And you are absolutely right. <laughs> and Hayek said it was very difficult for him after that to be critical of Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> in fact, he was a great admirer of Mrs. Thatcher. And uh, after this meeting, he had a dinner at the Institute of Economic Affairs in the, in the, in the autumn of 1979. And she said to my good friends who run the Institute, Lord Harris and Arthur Selton, oh, she is so beautiful. And you continued that friendship with Hayek uh, into your membership of the Montpelieron Society, a, an organization that I know a few people here have attended in the past. Perhaps you could tell us a bit more about what Montpelieron has meant for you over the years. I once had a discussion about this with Gary Becker, and he said, I think the Montpelieron Society is especially important to people from small countries like you come from, although, you know, uh, uh, I'm not uh, really anyone who is uh, apologizing from being from a small country. When I was at Oxford for the four years, they used to ask me, how many people live in Iceland? And we are so few that it's a little bit embarrassing. So I said, well, there are very few of us. We go for quality, not quantity, <laughs> in my country. But uh, he said it's important for isolated scholars in small countries to gather together and uh, learn what's happening and uh, what's challenging and how you can, uh, how you can really uh, pursue the argument to its end. And uh, one uh, example was actually uh, in a, a Montpellier Society meeting when Gary Becker said to us, I can't really see any economic arguments ag against the bigamy. If people want to have two wives, uh, then what is really wrong with that? Uh, and you know, th it is a good question. So uh, I went to a lot of Montpellier Society meetings. Uh, I had a very interesting debate in one of them in Sydney in Australia in 1985 with my former supervisor at Oxford, John Gray, and with Kenneth Minogue, who was a, uh, was a distinguished uh, political theorist about conservatism and liberalism, where I said that uh, my, uh, my uh, conservative liberalism was different from their liberal conservatism in, uh, in um, two ways. They didn't believe in progress, whereas we classical liberals, we believe in progress. And they were not universalists. They were both English, very English. And you know the English have a tendency, wonderful as they are, to look upon liberty as a kind of uh, uh, a good on which they have uh, a mon monopoly position. Uh, but I believe that liberty can be extended to the whole of mankind that it is a condition fit for the whole of mankind. So I'm a universalist in, in that sense. Uh, but to answer your question, it has been extremely interesting for me to be a part of this international debating club, which the uh, Montpellier Society is. Do you have any particular highlights, perhaps important people you've met there or influential people? Well, one of them actually uh, was uh, uh, well, the most impressive one, a scintillating person was uh, Milton Friedman. I first met him at the Montpellier Society meeting in 1980 in Stanford, and I said to Friedman, Professor Friedman, uh, I'm very busy defending you in Iceland against uh, attacks. Friedman said, no, 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 you shouldn't be defending me. You should be defending the ideas we share. And then, uh, through a rather complicated uh, set of events, uh, he uh, offered to come to Iceland uh, to give a lecture in the autumn of 1984. And a hilarious uh, thing happened. The, uh, I arranged for a, a television debate between him and three left-wing intellectuals. And uh, they discussed a lot of things, and uh, I'm not going go to go into that, it's on YouTube. But at the end, they made what they thought would be really the clinching uh, counter-argument against Friedman. 
and it was that I had arranged for Friedman to give a, his lecture and I charged a fee for the admission. And uh, one of the left-wing intellectuals said, Professor Friedman, I've enjoyed very much uh, discussing um, uh, all kinds of issues with you, but uh, I cannot afford to go to your lecture tomorrow. Uh, there's a charge, there's a fee to get in, and this has never happened before in the history of the university, and this is not my idea of freedom, uh, the left-wing intellectual said. Friedman re 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 replied, no, 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 you have got it totally wrong. Uh, <coughs> you, you have had many people lecturing before. They all cost some money. You had to pay their EFA, their accommodation, uh, advertisements uh, for the uh, event, and, um, and, and so on. What you're really saying is that those who do not attend the lecture should pay for it, but not only those who, who are attending it. And uh, I don't think this is good freedom, that others should pay for what, uh, what I am enjoying. This is precisely hanging up with uh, David Friedman's uh, uh, description of the, of the price mechanism here before. And let me also add uh, that actually David Friedman was the first speaker that we united in the uh, autumn of 1979 uh, to Iceland. Friedman was like Hayek uh, an extremely uh, impressive person. Small of stature, he was an intellectual giant. And uh, what he said was always so uh, totally to the point. For example, he said to me, Hannes, I believe that we should have an 11th commandment. It should be, thou shalt not do good at other people's expense. <laughs> and we can see how the left is always extremely good, but there's always somebody else who has to pay the bill. Then he discussed the, um, the European Union with me, uh, Friedman, and he said, uh, I think the European Union isn't really all that good an idea because it essentially, he said, a customs union. And we do not need customs unions because we should just unilaterally uh, abolish all customs and tariffs because they are worst for those who impose them. They raise the prices of goods in the country imposing them. Uh, so, and uh, he also said, I think I'm not entirely sure that the euro is going to last because there is a great difference between the 50 states of the United States uh, that use the dollar and the 27 or 28 uh, countries in Europe that uh, are supposed to be using the euro. And it is that the labor market in the United States is much more flexible than it is in uh, Europe and also that social mobility is much greater in, in the United States than it is in uh, Europe. It's much more difficult for somebody to, to go from Greece to Ireland than to go from Arkansas to Massachusetts. A, a lot of such things, he said, he was very uh, kind to me. Uh, he invited me, he and Rose, they invited me to their summer house. And uh, I said to them, uh, I would like to uh, read a book. I always take a book with me to bed. And he gave me the book by Barbara Branden about uh, Ayn Rand. And uh, he said, possibly Ayn Rand made more people into libertarians than Hayek and I combined. Now, your commitment to classical liberal principles hasn't always kept you on the right side of the law. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your uh, brush with the authorities in Iceland. Well, I used to tell my students in political philosophy that there was only one of my convictions uh, of which I was proud. And it was when I uh, ran in 1984 uh, an illegal radio station in protest against the government monopoly uh, of broadcasting. Uh, we uh, ran the radio station for eight days. The police was chasing us, trying to, uh, trying to find out uh, the, where the transmitter was. And finally they, they got us and closed the station and we were prosecuted and I was sentenced to a fine. And if I didn't pay the fine, I would serve 12 days in prison. I wrote to the Ministry of Justice and said that I refused completely to pay the fine and I would, uh, I would just take the prison o o option. But unfortunately, while I was in California at the Stanford one, uh, one or two months, somebody, probably out of some motherly feeling for me, paid the fine without me knowing. I had actually uh, waited for interest, uh, uh, with great interest uh, for, for being in prison for a while because I knew it would probably be my only chance of being in a, in a prison. But, 
One thing is interesting. We were successful because after the police had closed uh, our uh, uh, radio station, there was a huge uproar in the country. And a year later, the uh, government uh, monopoly of broadcasting was abolished. And this has also led to you um, building a relationship with political parties in Iceland that ultimately has uh, taken you to some interesting places. Perhaps you could talk about your relationship with the Independence Party. Well, I was, I, I was and I still am the best friend, I think, uh, of the uh, man who was the leading politician in Iceland and had a similar dominance over Icelandic politics like Thatcher and Reagan had in their respective countries. And his name is David Otson, and he formed a government in 1991, and he is the most successful uh, politician in Iceland. Uh, we liberalized and stabilized uh, um, the, the, the economy and we cut taxes, and uh, the economy became so strong that the recovery after the great shock of the uh, bank crisis in 2008 uh, was very quick. And I think that is really the best evidence of how successful the liberalization and stabilization in Iceland was in the period from 1991 to 2004. I sometimes uh, went with, uh, with uh, uh, David Otson on his um, visits to other countries. Uh, for example, we once had dinner with uh, Jacques Chirac in Paris, and to my great, to my great surprise, Jacques Chirac uh, didn't really drink wine. He drank uh, some beer from the Czech Republic. I found that uh, a bit strange. But uh, you know, then I went also once uh, with uh, David Otson to, uh, uh, to the White House and uh, to the Oval Office, and it so happened, it was on the 6th of July, um, 2004, that it was Bush's birthday. So we sang for him, happy birthday to you, uh, happy birthday to you, Mr. President. And Colin Powell stood next to me and he said, this is not really as nice as when Marilyn Monroe uh, was singing the same song. Uh, I can see that we're running out of time, and, and there's so many more areas I would have loved to have discussed with you, including your time in the Central Bank. But what, what is perhaps one sort of piece of advice you would like to Im impart on our, our guests as they embark on this adventure through the freedom movement together? Arthur Smith's old analysis, division of labor. Some of you should get rich and become donators to the classical liberal movement. Some of you should become serious scholars and explore all kinds of arguments and issues, both from the past and for the future. And some of you should become activists and uh, make the message intelligible uh, for, for young people and be the fisher, fishers of men, as Jesus said to Peter. Uh, so, division of labor, uh, not, this is not mutually exclusive, and all of us should work together for uh, this common uh, for this common goal, at the, um, actually when Milton Friedman came to Iceland, uh, one of the reporters, a very arrogant one, he said to him, Do, could you sum up your solutions in any one word? Friedman said, yes, I can. Oh, the reporter was very surprised. And what is that word? Freedom. Professor Gilles Harrison, thank you.